Welcome, everybody. My name is Roger Derling, and I'm the executive director of the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. And um, I'm so excited to be able to talk to the directors and, and producer of the incredible uh, film Mucho Mucho Amor, The Legend of Walter Mercado. Um, buenas tardes, todo el mundo. Mi nombre es Roger Durling. Yo soy el director ejecutivo del, del Festival de Cine de Santa Bárbara. Y es el placer de darles la bienvenida a los directores de la película Mucho Amor, a Mucho Mucho Amor, la, la leyenda de Walter Mercado y el productor también de la película. Um, um, th this movie celebrates the cultural impact of the legend Walter Mercado. Um, and uh, all, at the same time, it celebrates the complexity of the Latino culture. And that's actually one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about this film. Um, the film has gotten unanimous rave reviews. IndieWire says the film is a wild ride and a loving portrait providing a vital record of this outsized figure who was so ahead of his time, it seemed as though he transcended the laws of the universe. Um, welcome, guys. Um, I actually want to start by asking you that this, this person, uh, Walter Mercado, was such an important um, person and such incredible cultural impact. Um, why hadn't we had a documentary done about him prior to you guys taking it? That's a, that's a great question. And it's one, the three of us, you know, I think Alex can tell the story best, but the three of us all had that exact same thought. We all wanted to make a movie about Walter Mercado, and we all had the thought, which was, this must have been done. Somebody must have done this a long time ago. He's an incredibly fascinating figure. He broke every single rule during the period where he was on television. He's endlessly entertaining, and then he disappeared. So somebody must be looking for him. And so the three of us, I mean, Alex, maybe you want to tell the story, um, found yeah. each other at, during the search to tell this story. And, you know, we say that we're likely, you know, that this story hasn't been told yet because there aren't enough young Latino filmmakers. There are not enough Latino filmmakers generally. And uh, I think the three of us really want to show the complexity of our culture. You know, we're not, we're, we're more than narcos and we have very interesting figures that need to be celebrated. And there are a thousand more, um, but uh, of, of these kinds of stories that need to be told. But yeah, Alex, if you want to tell the story. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up. I think there's, there, I think hopefully we're starting to see a change in, in that. And I think, you know, like Christina had, Christina and I had been colleagues at Fusion um, prior to making this movie. Uh, I had moved on to HBO and I was living in New York City and a friend of mine introduced me to Kareem. And the first thing we talked about was Walter because it just so happened that Walter was having an estate sale in Miami. And I was very jealous. I was born and raised in Miami. So I was like very jealous I wasn't there. Um, and you know, I, that was the kind of first question I asked him because I'd seen Kareem's movies and loved them. And I was like, how has no one done a documentary on this guy? Like, have they? And Kareem said, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to the estate sale to try to buy a cape, but I'm also going to see if I can meet someone from his family to talk about that. And I immediately, I mean, I had a full-time job at the time, but I was like, I'm in, you know, like, please let me help in any way. And he meets Walter's niece, uh, Danette, and we set a time to follow up, to talk about it amongst ourselves. And 30 minutes before that call, Christina calls me kind of out of the blue and says, hey, I was talking to some mutual friends and I heard you're obsessed with Walter Mercado. I want to make a movie about him. And I was like, this is like... Speaking of Walter, this, this is like some weird cosmic, cosmic thing. I have a call in 30 minutes with another director, but like maybe this is a sign. Like maybe you guys should like work together. So I introduced them and to their credit, like an arranged marriage for those that don't know about making a film. I mean, it's like a decision you're gonna live, you're gonna spend two years of your life minimum with this with this person. They were like, Yeah, I'm in. If you love Walter, I love Walter, let's go do it. That's terrific. Um, I, I read that you guys started a movie without having much budget. Um, you know, can, can, how, how difficult was it to, uh, to get people behind the project? Extremely, <laughs> extremely difficult. 
which we were all surprised about, to be very candid, because, you know, uh, Alex is a, a VP at HBO and uh, had worked in, uh, in the film industry for several years at a lot of companies had produced a couple of short films. I had just made a small film, uh, The Last Resort, that was well-reviewed and which played is- in theaters. Uh, Christina had just made Science Fair, which won the Best of the Fest Award at Sundance and, uh, and an award at South by Southwest. So we were like, oh, well, and we had Walter Mercado, this immensely entertaining, fascinating, beloved uh, uh, character, personality. And we were like, that's it. This is like the, the winning team. It's going to take, you know, two phone calls and we're done. <laughs> uh, and two phone calls uh, that took a year and a half uh to raise uh any real money we, we got a small um a grant from a, an organization in miami called artist miami uh and that was a small grant that lasted us that we had to stretch to last for a year and a half we def- everybody deferred payment we called in favors we tested the limits of our friendships uh, <laughs> <laughs> really it was, it was nuts and we made we made the whole film for you know basically for a seventh of our budget in the end before before Netflix came on and and saved us. But there, we you know we wouldn't have been able to finish the film. We weren't able to to uh, raise the money we needed to make it. And uh, you know it was this it was a young Latino executive at Netflix who was basically like yeah I get it I grew up with Walter. I know that this is going to do well with this community and I can vouch for this person. And so having him in that room, I think really is what, what allowed us to make the film in the end. So uh, we're incredibly grateful to Netflix and for the people who believed in it when before there was you know anything to believe in. <laughs> How difficult was it to convince Walter to open up his story to you guys? Yeah, uh, Walter Walter uh, was very excited. You see in the film, he's very excited by the lights and the cameras. And so he, he wanted to do the film. But I think he didn't understand what a documentary was when he signed up for it. So, you know, on the first day of shooting, I remember he asked Kareem, he was like, Kareem, when will I be receiving my scripts for, for the day? <laughs> We were like, no, Walter, that's not how it worked. And he would always want to call, you know, like we would have been filming for an hour and then all of a sudden he would go, and action. Like, <laughs> and we were like, what? We've, we've been filming you. This is a documentary. And so he, he always wanted to, uh, you know, he wanted to, to stage things and he wanted everything to be interesting. So that's why he's always evoking to the camera. He, he came up during a time when you can't waste tape you know, he, everything has to be usable. And so uh, he was trying to be constantly interesting. And he always was, he was so worried we were making the most boring film in the world. Because <laughs> he was like, no one's going to want to watch me eat breakfast. It's so boring. <laughs> Which reminds me one of the great quotes in the film that he says is to be different is a gift to be ordinary's coming. What an incredible lesson to get from him directly. Um, yeah. would, um, you know, can you tell us about, about, about that, about being in his presence and him understanding that, that being ordinary is, is common? I think he owes a lot, uh, and as he said, he owes that really to his mother, who was a young child when he was very different in a number of ways. Uh, she encouraged him instead of trying to kind of clip his wings. She really said, you know, it's fine. You're, you're different. Go on being different. And uh, I think that that gave Walter the permission to be himself. And, you know, whether that meant being magical and having these other powers or being a young queer boy, um, you know, Walter didn't uh, use labels, but I think that we had, we've, we've officially uh, taken him in as a, a queer icon. So I think that that permission from his mother really was the key factor to the life that followed. If, if he hadn't had that kind of, uh, embrace and support at home, um, you know, I don't think that we would have had the same Walter because he was growing up in, you know, little port, little rural Puerto Rico in the 1930s and 40s, uh, a very Catholic, very machista, very conservative uh, place. And he was, uh, he was incredibly different. Uh, and he always embraced that. I mean, and he was always different. I mean, even at, you know, in 88, you didn't meet, you've never been in the presence of somebody like Walter Mercado. 
but he fully embodied that difference at every at every moment and with the comfort and ease uh, that we admired a great deal. Which is one of the things that I love so much about your documentary and it's so um, life affirming that it, it, it took a lot of bravery for him to be himself. I mean, we're all struggling to, to embrace who we are. And here's this man that is fully comfortable uh, being, you know, be yourself. Um, it's, it, and you guys captured, as I said, that you capture so beautifully um, that. You know, what I, I is always fascinating to me about Walter is that he loves himself so much. And on almost everybody, anybody else, that would be a really annoying characteristic, the, the narcissism of that. But somehow I think with Walter, it's endearing. And, and, he, and it's endearing to me because he loves himself, but he always loves everybody else even more. And I think that's a really important part of Walter's personality, that he, he was very confident and very self-assured, but he also was confident in you. And he also was, you know, he, he would give so much of himself. Um, but he definitely was radically, he, his self-love at that time is a radical act. To, to, to be yourself so boldly is um, incredibly ahead of its time. Now, Alex, um, having two directors, was that, was that a challenge for you as a producer or, or they totally got along well? It was so easy. <laughs> it was very easy and there were never, ever disagreements. No, actually, I mean, actually, uh, fortunately for me, um, it was not really, uh, you know, there was no drama, thankfully. Uh, that, that was like the good part. But obviously, yeah, there's disagreements and there's also, you know, Chris, Christina's in LA where I am, Kareem's in Miami. So that was its own wild challenge, you know? And I think these guys really like toughed it out at times because, you know, Christina would spend all day maybe in an edit booth and then send stuff over to Kareem. And then Kareem would spend like late into the night, you know, writing his notes and then send them in the morning. And then those ha would have to be adjusted. So it was this very exhausting workflow i think for both of them um and then kareem would obviously come out and i think honestly when kareem was in la and everyone was in the same room that was some of my favorite times making the movie because it's just like everything would just start moving in the right direction you know um mm. and so it was so nice to have everybody in the same place but no i mean i i i we i think we got along great i mean we had a great time it's some of like these last three years have been like some of the best memories of my life you know it was just like going to puerto rico being in like this airbnb with these guys you know late night pizzas and like walgreens quesadillas you know it's just like it's just stuff that like you know, you, that's, it's, it's, it's half the reason you do this, you know? So I think I lucked out, uh, really, or maybe it was, or maybe it was Walter, uh, sending the juju and telling us, you know, we needed to work together. Were there, were there, th were there were questions there that were not allowed to be, there were subjects that you were not allowed to approach uh, Walter about? No, thankfully, I mean, honestly, I don't know if we would have, knowing the, knowing the three of us, uh, A, I don't know if we would have abided by that rule first and yeah. foremost and b i don't even know if we would have gone down that road if there were things off the table to their credit there really was never like there wasn't even a warning that walter doesn't like talking about some things it was like we had carte blanche in in, in asking him we learned in that process however <laughs> that there were things that walter did not like talking about um he did not like talking about his age um he uh did not talk about death um he uh, he did not. He wasn't crazy talking about his plastic surgeries. <laughs> um, sexuality was the other thing. Um, and uh, but actually, you know, the part that he really liked to talk about the least were any of the difficult times, anything that was negative, the legal troubles, the, uh, the health troubles. That was even harder than all of those other things combined, actually, because. Uh, he just, he was a person who did not dwell on the negative. He, he left no space in his life for negativity. He was the most overwhelmingly optimistic person. So to, to get him to talk about and recollect those times was incredibly difficult. 
and how did you approach it? I mean, I, 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 I want to comment that he may not have liked to talk about the plastic surgery or age or his sexuality, but I love the way you get him to masterfully answer um, those questions. Um, how, how, what was your technique about getting to trust you? We yelled at him. We yelled at him a lot. <laughs> That's right. No, I mean, I, to be honest, I think trust is, I, I just want to say trust is a key word there. Like when we started shooting with Walter, we presented him with a with an appearance release. And we got all these notes back from his lawyer. And the, the notes were basic, the notes basically nullified, it made the appearance release pointless. <laughs> like, you know, it was just like, not, it, it all said like, yes, but yes, but. And so we, you know, we worked on trust for a little bit, you know, we worked on like, look, let's, let's develop a relationship together. And these two sat with him for a long period of time, a lot of off camera conversations with Kareem and Christina can talk more about. Um, and then as we had enough trust and an agreement and all this stuff in place, sometimes, you know, like I would run and go get one of the nieces and say, your uncle's telling lies. He's saying that everything was great in Cleveland or whatever it was, you know? And, uh, and they'd come upstairs and be like, Walter, tell them about what it was like in the hospital, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but you guys have talked to him a lot off camera, right? Yeah. I think, you know, we became very close with Walter, the three of us, um, you know, at his funeral, Kareem and Alex were pallbearers. I think we became mm. part of his day to day and he, we had a lot of fun with him. We loved him so much. He made us laugh. The thing that we didn't know growing up was that Walter is like, he could have been a stand-up comedian. He is so fast and his timing is amazing. And the three of us love laughing. And so he would do anything he could to, to get us to laugh. And a lot of times that kind of went hand in hand with evading answers. And you see it in the film, you know, mm -hmm. you see him evade answers by making us laugh. I have a training as an investigative journalist. So I'm trained to not let people get away with questions. But in certain moments, like in the one where Kareem asks him if he's a virgin and he goes, the only one in town. <laughs> that moment, that response got us to stop asking questions. And like re-watching the tape, I was so ashamed of myself that I had let him like just get away with it. And like we all, you could hear us laughing in the moment and we totally just like moved on to the next conversation topic so he had so he had you know so much camera training and so much um training with latin like gossip media which is like yeah. them they are the meanest kinds of journalists in the world so he he was just so um he was so prepared we couldn't you know get him to talk about things he really didn't want to talk about very easily um, and we wore know, him down. I should yeah, add that. Yeah. We, we yeah. asked, I mean, really, we asked the say the questions that you ultimately saw on camera were asked dozens of times across, you know, the hundreds of hours that we filmed with him. Um, and, you know, so that made a difference. Obviously, the, the trust and the, the conversations were happening simultaneously. But I mean, those are not the, the first time we asked them those questions. Um, so much so, we were just, we were relentless, so much so that Willie, his assistant, would call us Piojito, which uh, in English translates to little lice, and at the end yeah. of the day, he was like, okay, Piojitos, bye-bye, uh, <laughs> he was like, go away, because we were, we were relentless, but I think that it, it also built, a, you know, part of that built this, uh, helped us build this closeness through it all. No. Now you built the closeness. You spent two years with him. Um, and, and Christina, you mentioned you're you're an investigative reporter, you know, a journalist. I mean, a documentarian. Um, as time progressed and he opened up to to you more, you got closer to him. Was it was it difficult for you to keep a, a perspective, to keep an objectivity because of the closeness you were getting to him? You know, I think that we had this conversation a lot is, is, you know, he is somebody who we love, but he's also not perfect. And he's done things in his life that, you know, whether or not Bill was in charge of them or not, he participated in, in these things that, um, you know, I don't think he's proud of, but we're certainly critical of like the 1-800 phone lines mm. and all that. So we talked a lot about, you know, how much do we have a duty to tell that story? How much is this film going to be celebrating Walter? You know, uh, even our heroes are flawed. And so I think we, we wanted to show that. 
Um, but yeah, really over time, at, at the first shoots he wanted to present this very like put together Walter that we had seen on television in full makeup and full hair for 30 years. And as we got closer and closer, he started letting us into his more intimate spaces. Like, for example, the house itself is um, set up basically like a set. He taped all of his horoscopes from his home. So everything was a set. And then there was this big mirrored wall with a secret door in it. And once you went behind that door was where you found the place where Walter actually lived, where his bedroom was, where he put on his makeup. And, and so it took time and trust and eventually he let us start filming in that room, um, you know, and you see it in the film when he's, you know, in bed and watching mm -hmm. TV. Um, and everything else in the house, there are other bedrooms in the house that are like staged bedrooms. So um, it, it did, uh, you know, it, it took a long time to win his trust to show complexity of, but, but this was, like I said, a constant conversation of, of, you know, how you tell a story about somebody you love, but how you also um, do justice to the parts of their lives that have not been great. So we, we tried to do both of those things. If, if there's an antagonist in the story is Bill Pecula, and to your credit, um, you show uh, objectivity about him. You let us be the judge on his character. Can you tell us about, um, how, was it difficult to uh, convince him to participate in the story and your approach that you're very objective about him? Yeah, I, I was able, it was, it was a little hard to track him down at first because Bill still doesn't have much of a social media presence and had even less than, um, but I finally made contact through his son and we WhatsApped a little bit and he was in Thailand actually running um, a, a, like an agricultural business. Um, it was, it was some sort of philanthropic end to it. Uh, so he wasn't working in entertainment anymore. And, um, and we set a time to talk and we got on the phone and, you know, the thing is the three of us really did our homework, good and bad. And it's important for us. We say it in the film, but it's also important for us to say it now, which is that like, we came to know Walter through Primer Impacto and that doesn't happen without Bill Bakula. So it is this really complicated relationship where like Bill sort of made him known to us in a different kind of way certainly in Latin America, right? Like in places like Panama, you know, like Mexico, like the, the syndication that happened was all a result of Bill's work. Um, and so, uh, you know, he was very open and he was like, I'll answer any questions. There was at some point, some hesitation on his part. Like he got a little bit of cold feet, I think the morning we were gonna shoot and said, great, I'm so excited to meet with you guys, just no cameras. And I had to say, mm. well, Bill, you know, doc documentaries have cameras. There's going to have to be cameras there. And he sort of got like, you know, what I was saying. And he showed up and he answered all of our questions. He really did. He has his own point of view on it, whether you agree with it or not. Um, you know, and, uh, and, and yeah, we have to let the audience decide. And, you know, there's other people that have account that are accountable in this situation, like the, the lawyer who originally represented Walter clearly, you know, didn't live up to his fiduciary responsibilities. So, you know, uh, that's, I think that was our perspective is like, is like trying to paint the full bill picture, you know, as well. Another incredible character in your documentary is Willie Acosta. Um, can you tell us about the inclusion of him and um, how, what, what was it like working with him? We, we love Willie. Willie, I'm not sure he loved us during production. Now he loves us. <laughs> why, why didn't he like you guys? Well, you know, we would hang around that house for a long time and film for as long as we were allowed to film. And his job, his entire life is devoted to um, being Walter's protector in every single way. You know, he picks out what Walter is going to wear every day. He, he makes sure Walter looks good from every angle his entire life was dedicated to, to, you know, making sure Walter was at his best. And, um, you know, he's a producer himself, so he n understands, you know, what it is that we're doing when he doesn't like a camera shot, he doesn't like, you know, an angle of how Walter looked, he would say, no, 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 not here, not here. And, you know, he, did, he, he really wanted to have authorship as well over 
what the film would look like. Um, but that said, we are obsessed with Willie. He is a wonderful person. And I think an incredibly talented, you know, we, we look at some of the very first uh, um, shows that Walter did and Willie's name is listed as a producer. He was, he must've been like a teenager, maybe early twenties. And he was constructing these amazing sets and these amazing costumes. And so he has been Walter's best friend and Walter's life partner. And he has also been a creative collaborator and he is also part of the reason Walter was able to be so great was that Willie was there the whole time protecting him. Um, but yeah. I, I would say that also one of the difficulties is was what we were doing in many ways went against everything Willie was supposed to do, right? Willie was supposed to guard Walter, make sure that Walter only ever looked flawless, uh, control a situation, not talk about personal things, not let others talk about personal things. And we were doing completely the opposite of that. So the, the nature of our relationship was almost antagonistic going in. And it never was, but we, we came in saying all these things that you've done for 50 years, we're going to do completely the opposite of what you've never wanted to do. And that was difficult. Um, you know, it was difficult to get Willie to sit down for an interview. He, he did not, he did not, was not used to being in front of the camera and didn't really have a, a real desire to be in front of the camera. Although I think later on, he eventually started to enjoy it towards the end. But it was really hard to get him to sit down and talk. Uh, but we knew that it's kind of like Bill. You don't, we don't have a Walter without Willie, and we had to get him to sit down and talk. We were a little scared of him too. Like, like he would get mad at us, and so like we would alternate who had to ask Willie to put his like lav mic on because it'd be like, who's gonna? Are you gonna? Can you ask Willie? And I'd be like, no, no, I asked him last time. He gets very upset. You ask him. Yeah. And then sometimes he would rebel and he'd be like, oh, he would be, fine. I wear the, I'll wear the microphone. And he would take it from you and he would put it on the outside with the wire, like showing very ugly so that it would look terrible in the shot, you know? <laughs> he savvy enough to like, you know, do that. And we'd be like, Willie, you have to put it under the shirt. Please just humor me this time, you know? Uh, so it was very, it was sort of fun in that way of like, you know, trying to go around Willie. But I would be annoyed by us too, you know, like I, <laughs> you know, I, if I, cause, because we know how production works and he knows how production works and he's, you know, he was like not impressed or charmed by our cameras. <laughs> he was like, oh, fine. Yeah. <laughs> I, and, and as we as Cubans say the bobo no, te, no tenía un pelo you know what I mean like like when we were trying to get Walter to do that to answer that question he's never answered like Willie knew exactly what we were doing from the beginning you know so yeah it was it was fun it was a chess match sometimes <laughs> the big to me the big moment I, that I got very emotional is uh, the, the moment with Lee manuel Miranda. And the reason why I get so emotional watching that scene is because it, there you capture the cultural impact of Walter. Um, it is, there is a validation of what his legacy, of Walter's legacy, and as I said, his cultural impact. How did it come about getting, capturing that moment and getting Le Manuel Miranda involved in your documentary. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think you, Lynn is the is a stand-in for all of us in that moment. It's what it feels like to meet Walter. It's like going to the North Pole and and meeting Santa Claus. It's like it's um, an, a surreal feeling. And and I, I just like Lynn Manuel was on the verge of tears when he met Walter. I think the three of us had. I think it's the closest to a religious experience I've ever had <laughs> to meeting Walter for the first time. Um, but that came about another incredible coincidence. Um, uh, Lynn Manuel was on the island uh, opening Hamilton um, to help with the hurricane relief effort. And uh, we planned our trip around his stay on the off chance we'd be able to to, to, he'd be able to film and meet Walter. And Alex is a friend who is in um, an improv group with, with Lynn and just ha texted, Alex had his friend text Lynn and he was like, yeah, absolutely. Like, I have no time for anything else. I'm not gonna do any press in front of Hamilton or before the opening, but I, if I can meet Walter, I would love to meet Walter. And so 
uh, yeah, it was really beautiful. He, it was about a half an hour, 45 minutes, the whole thing. And um, we're just, you know, that actually, that, that piece of footage did help us sell the film very much. I, I think because you were able to show it to executives who didn't grow up with Walter and say, look, like here's the superstar fangirling out uh, about an uh, even bigger star that you've never heard of. And so I think that that was incredibly helpful. Um, it just, it, like you said, it represents so much of, of, of why Walter is important and what he means to the Latino community. Did you guys always you that know that the um, museum event was going to happen? Did did you tailor your documentary for that to be the cl the climax or the the the? Mm. No, it was just no uh, no. It, so we we always hoped. I think when we went in, we sort of hoped that that Walter would like make a comeback, right? Like we wanted, like, I think there was always a plan to like show him the memes and the gifts, you know, and go look like young people love you and then just see what he wanted to do about that, you know? Um, but, you know, obviously as documentarians, like we're not trying to like, over, we're not trying to like dictate what happens, right? So, uh, but Miami is a very small town. And so, um, that museum knew that Kareem was making had had actually gone to the same estate sale that that Walter uh, uh, that Kareem had gone to and knew that Kareem was making a film subsequently. And I think that when something gets in the zeitgeist, especially like in a place that's actually like Miami's a pretty small town, like I think that it just be, it just becomes a thing where it's like I guess Walter like Walter it's it's Walter Mercado's year, you know, or whatever it was, and they like they just made that happen. The, the performance thing that you see, that was something that Walter told us on our first trip, he had a vision of. He didn't say he wanted to do it at, at a museum, but he had this statue, this like bust of him that he wanted to unveil with all of these dancers or whatever. So we knew like that would happen somewhere, but we thought like maybe like an art gallery in San Juan, like we didn't think it would be this like, you know, museum expo thing that they did. Retrospect. And what you what you don't see in that in the doc, which I'm still a little sad about, is the is that that dance that is being done with all the dancers and the throne. That was all Walter's vision. He yeah. he, along with an amazing choreographer named Rosie Herrera in Miami, choreographed it together. And uh, each one of the dancers represents a different sign of the zodiac. And it's, um, it's like, he picked the music, he picked the, like, he, this is, he, he had this grand entry planned. And um, the throne that he was sitting on, another detail, the throne that he was sitting on, he had to be whisked away out of it because it had a quinceanera to attend. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so it was like, okay, Walter, get out of the chair, get out of the chair, and had to go to a quinceanera afterwards. <laughs> And speaking of details that are so delicious, and there are many in your documentary leading up to the museum event, um, he's doing the invites, La Bestia, the Beast. That that I I, I wanted more at that about that moment. I have to tell you, uh, because I live in Miami and born and raised here, which is a very Latino city. When I heard that, I didn't blink or even find it funny because everyone that I know has a name of some kind of animal. Like my, <laughs> older, bro like my older brother was a tiburon. And like, you know, and so I was like, yeah, what? what? And uh, I think Alex has been away from Miami too long. And Christina grew up in, in Milwaukee and they laugh their asses off. And I'm like, wait, what? What's I, 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 don't, I don't get it. Of course he knows somebody called La Bestia. <laughs> Thing that made the thing that made me laugh was that he translates it because he kept doing yeah. this thing. He kept doing this thing where he insisted when the cameras were on, he would just switch into English, and we'd be like, "Walter, you can just speak in whatever like Spanish, like you normally speak in Spanish." And he would be like, "Okay, okay," and then he'd start in Spanish and then switch back into English. And the fact that he goes, "He is a beast in perfumes," is like my <laughs> favorite. Like that explanation is the thing that destroys me every time. You know. <laughs> And uh, we still, we're still looking for La Bestia. So if yeah. Oh, knows, so you never we, met La Bestia. We have no idea who La Bestia is. We do know they're a beast in perfumes, but not, nothing else. So if anyone knows who La Bestia is, we, we're looking. That's a and whole so, other short film, is like finding la, the search for La Bestia. <laughs> search for La Bestia. It's such a great moment, and I kept waiting for the 
for the reveal that at the um, at the museum event we were actually going to get an introduction to La Bestia. We couldn't find his con. We could, no one could. No one had current contact information. Like the family's contact information was outdated. We like tried to track him down. Yeah. Can you? Uh, if you're out there, reach out to us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the um, the animation. Can you tell us about the usage of the animation, in particular the the Tara, the the Rider uh, weight cards? Yeah, I think we so we talked about this a, a lot, and one of the things that we wanted to make sure to be able to do is kind of take viewers into the magical world that Walter kind of existed in and uh, be able to kind of illustrate those magical moments that he talks about. Um, and so we thought about recreations. We do a little bit of recreations at the very beginning of the scene where we recreate the living rooms uh, where families are watching Walter, but uh, it didn't kind of, it didn't completely take us into the world. And um, Christina really brilliantly had the idea, said, you know, why don't we do something in the tarot world? Um, and Walter had a favorite deck called the Rider Weight Tarot deck. Uh, that was his preferred. Um, and we said animation would be great. Uh, it was an animator that I really loved and I always wanted to work with named Alexa Lim Haas. Uh, so we went to her with Christina's idea of doing something the style of Rider weight, and she took it and interpreted it, I mean, really beyond their expectations. It's, we were, were floored when we saw it. We so fell in love. Um, and it's, it's, it's one of our you know, most beautiful parts of the film, I think. You really kind of get you're able to kind of transport yourself into that magical and also like the magical realism, which is such a part of Latino culture. Uh, yeah, we loved it. She did an amazing job. Yeah, I think when, when something is your own film, you can see the flaws in every single part of it. And those are the only things that when I watch, I'm like, they're great. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I don't see when I watch it like that. That's my favorite part of the film because Alexa is so talented. Um, the complexity of the gender non-conforming aspect of his life and and the fact that it was at a time when it was not accepted by society or even discussed you know the term um was was walter aware of of that that complexity maybe more so than us in in, in some ways because he had been talking about it for decades, you know, which is one of the brilliant things that we realized in, about him in, in making the film. We came across interviews in archival where he says, you know, you know, gender is a construct uh, of our own making. The future is not going to be masculine and feminine. Um, so I think he was acutely aware of, of that, uh, more so than, than most people had been and had been talking about it. Um, and he had always, you know, he came, you know, we would say he came up being himself and uh, challenging the notions of what a man was supposed to look like or dress like. And, uh, and he always described it as blending energies. He, he blended the feminine and the masculine. Um, the curious thing about Walter, though, is that w whether it's through the, his gender expression or whether it's his, uh, his approach to sexuality, I mean, he was such a pioneer and people will talk about it, but he was never the kind of person that kind of reflected about his own legacy in that way. Like he just, he knew that, yes, of course, it, for him, it was so second nature. Of course I did that. Uh, he didn't, you know, he didn't pat himself on the back or even recognize what he, what he did for others in doing that. And uh, Walter had a lot of ego, but he also, I think in a weird way was also very, very humble about some things. And I think that maybe that's where the, some of the humility kind of, uh, came in or just or maybe he just didn't reflect on on the fact that he by doing that broke so many barriers and I know that Willie uh, um, deals I mean he speaks about it in the documentary um, but Walter must I mean not must have he encountered a lot of homophobia and a lot of uh, name calling and and he was the butt of a, a lot of jokes um, what, how, how do you guys feel that he felt about it? You know, he, he, yeah, he wears, like Willie says, he wears Vaseline, so nothing, nothing sticks on him. Also the bala. So that, the, the, I don't care pill and the, and the Vaseline, 
those are both uh, mistranslations from Spanish that we loved. But he, uh, you know, I, I think it hurt him. I think it hurt him a lot. I think he didn't like talking about it. He, like we said, we, he didn't like talking about the bad times or, um, or the haters, as he'd call them. But it, it hurt his feelings. I think, you know, he is a se sensitive person. And uh, it didn't it didn't stop him from being himself, and I think um, he is you know incredibly brave because during that time and still now it's you know it's very hard in our culture to be different in any way, and especially to be gay or to be queer or to be perceived as effeminate in any way. You know, it's an incredibly homophobic machista culture, so it took a lot of bravery. But you see, he, he doesn't, it, it never stopped him. In, in the film, he, he even goes on these shows with like all of these super masculine dudes who are teasing him about being gay. And he's the smartest person on the stage and he can like dish it out quicker than they can. And so he, I, I, it's incredible to watch these interactions where you see that he is in complete control of, of the stage, even though he's being criticized and made fun of um, and, and that's, you know, part of his media training, part of the reason he was so good at, at, at firing back at us was because he had been through this gauntlet for so long of homophobia and he, he encountered it so much in, in, on television, in, in popular culture. Um, and yeah, he's incredibly brave. And I, I thought it was so beautiful when we get to the museum event that you, he, I think that he he knew that he has become he had become this um, icon for the LGBTQ community, right? Yeah, I think he he definitely had to he he, he it was it's such an opening uh, an open uh, scenario where there were you know there were drag queens there were openly gay folks who came up to him and thanked him, uh, and I you know I remember uh, one of the drag queens uh, told me afterwards that he said he said to her, you're so brave. And, uh, and she was like, you, you did this for us. You gave us space to, to, to be who we are. Uh, so I hope that some of that seeped into him, but I think that was a really, that for me, that was the most meaningful moment was being able to capture him with his audience once again and seeing, because it, it, it went both ways. It meant so much to everybody who was there and met him, but it meant so much to him too. Mm -hmm. Was he able to see the documentary? He ended up seeing about 15 to 20 minutes of it. Um, Kareem and I were with him uh, five weeks before he passed away and we were able to show him part of it. He saw the part about his childhood and his unlikely rise to fame. And I think it was a lot of footage he hadn't seen in a very long time. And so he, he loved it. He was really excited by the process of making the film. I think he was comforted that we actually knew what we were doing and it actually looked like a film. <laughs> and um, he was just, he was so excited. He knew it was going on Netflix and Netflix w was his favorite. Um, he, he, once he learned it was going on Netflix when we were filming with him, he would just start trying to plug Netflix and he'd say, <laughs> he'd say, oh, my favorite programming on Netflix. And we were like, no, I'll <laughs> <laughs> we don't need that. <laughs> um, but he loved it. And, uh, you know, the, the goal was always the rush to, into production without the funding. The goal was always to have Walter there with us to, during the premiere. So, you know. And do you think, I mean, because he died 24 hours after you guys finished the documentary and you had the museum event as well, do you think that after those two things were accomplished, he was he was able to let go? Yeah, I think definitely, I think, you know, the timing of it, I, I think at some level he knew his work was done, that the, the film had been finished, we had submitted it to Sundance, which was our goal and his goal. Um, and yeah, at some level, I think he, he, he knew he had finished what he had to do and that his legacy was, you know, complete in some way. Well, it continues um, because, I mean, the timing of the release of your documentary couldn't have come at a better time when we need to be reminded that um, we need love and we need to learn how to love one another more. I mean, that the Walter's message is, is needed now. It's more essential than ever. Yeah. Uh, 
absolutely. We agree. We couldn't agree more. I think, yeah. like, we have so many leaders who are so eager to remind us of how we're different and why we should hate each other. And um, I think we could all use Walter's message. And we need more leaders like Walter. We, we need more people who preach love instead of division and hatred. And and especially during the pandemic when we're all alone at home, it, you know, Walter has a way of making you think about. Um, yeah, the importance of kind of brotherhood and 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 um, what's what's most important in life. And so, yeah, we, it's definitely been an honor for I think the three of us to be working on this during these times. It's it reminds us every single day of what of what what really matters. Yeah, I mean that's what that it's remarkable. I mean, I I sort of always understood about Walter, but that your documentary articulates and crystallizes so well that the wigs and the makeup and the capes you know were simply just the the facade to ultimately the message of love that he was trying to articulate you know and and, and you guys had done such an incredible job um illustrating that so thank you no thank you so much for saying that i mean this has been a dream come true, I think, for us. Yeah. Well, be, you know, um, thank you for, for being here. But I, I think that it, Walter wouldn't be happy if we all four of us together sign everybody off that is watching with his signature. Y que Dios los bendiga todos hoy, mañana y siempre. Y que reciban de mí siempre paz. Mucha paz, pero sobre todo, mucho, 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 ¿qué? Amor. Amor. <laughs> Thank you, guys. You guys are the best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roger. Ciao.